Hi, Joanne here from Relax for a While, welcoming you to tonight's bedtime stories for your relaxation and sleep. So for tonight's bedtime stories, I have chosen two fairy tales that you may not have heard before. These are fairy tales about sisterhood. The first story is called Snow White and Rose Red. Now don't be fooled by the title, as this fairy tale has no relation to the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This is a sweet, simple tale by the Brothers Grimm. This is a story about two sisters who are opposites in every way except their love for each other. Many fairy tales feature sibling rivalry, so the loving and supporting relationship between Snow White and Rose Red is a welcoming change of pace. The second bedtime story is a fairy tale called Habogi. This is an old English tale by Andrew Lang that features the typical sibling rivalry between three sisters. In the story of Habogi, the two eldest sisters are jealous of the youngest, who is of course the more kind and lovely of the three. This lovely tale reminds us how sometimes things aren't always as they seem and to never judge a book by its cover. So I hope you find these two stories enjoyable as you settle comfortably under the covers, welcoming the coziness of your sleep space. As you now begin to unwind and prepare for relaxation and a restful night of sleep. And when you're ready, we will begin. A poor widow lived alone in a little cottage, in front of which was a garden where stood two little rose trees. One bore white roses, the other red. The widow had two daughters who resembled the two rose trees. One was called Snow White and the other Rose Red. They were two of the best daughters that ever lived. But Snow White was quieter and more gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked best to jump about in the meadows to look for flowers and catch butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother, helped her in the house, or read to her when there was nothing else to do. The two sisters loved one another so much that they always walked hand in hand. And when Snow White said, We will not forsake one another, Rose Red answered, Never, as long as we live. And the mother added, Yes, my children, whatever one has, let her divide with the other. They often ran about in solitary places and gathered red berries, and the wild creatures of the wood never hurt them, but came confidingly up to them. The little hare ate cabbage leaves out of their hands. The doe grazed at their side. The stag sprang merrily past them, and the birds remained sitting on their boughs and never ceased their songs. They met with no accident if they loitered in the wood and night came on. They lay down together on the moss and slept till morning, and the mother knew this and was in no anxiety about them. Once, when they had spent the night in the wood and the red morning awoke them, they saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress sitting by the place where they had slept, who arising and looking at them kindly said nothing but went into the wood. And when they looked round, they found that they had been sleeping close to a precipice and would certainly have fallen down it 
if they had gone a few steps farther in the dark. Their mother told them it must have been the angel that takes care of good sisters who had sat by them all night long. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's cottage so clean that it was a pleasure to look into it. In the summer, Rose Red managed the house, and every morning she gathered a wreath in which was a rose off each tree and set it by her mother's bed before she awoke. In winter, Snow White lighted the fire and hung the kettle on the hook, and though it was only copper, it shone like gold, it was rubbed so clean. In the evening, when the snow fell, the mother said, Go, Snow White, and bolt the door. And then they seated themselves on the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles and read aloud out of a great book. And the two girls listened and sat and spun. Near them lay a lamb on the floor, and behind them, on a perch, sat a white dove with its head under its wing. And one evening, as they were thus happy together, someone knocked to be let in. The mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door. Perhaps it is a traveler who seeks shelter. Rose Red went and pushed the bolt back and thought it was a poor man, but a bear stretched his thick black head into the door. Rose Red screamed and sprang back. The little lamb bleated, the little dove fluttered about, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. However, the bear began to speak and said, Do not be frightened, I will do you no harm. I am half frozen and only want to warm myself a little. You poor bear, said the mother. Lay yourself down before the fire. Only take care your fur does not burn. Then she called out, Snow White, Rose Red, come out. The bear will not hurt you. He means honestly by us. Then they both came out and... By degrees, the lamb and the dove also approached and ceased to be afraid. The bear said, Girls, knock the snow a little out of my fur. And they fetched a broom and swept the bear skin clean. And he stretched himself before the fire and growled softly, like a bear that was quite happy and comfortable. In a short time, they all became quite friendly together, and the girls played tricks with the awkward guest. They pulled his hair, set their feet on his back, and rolled him here and there, and when he growled, they laughed. The bear was very much pleased with this frolic, only when they became too mischievous, he called out, Girls, leave me alone. When bedtime came and the others went to sleep, the mother said to the bear, You can lie there on the hearth, and then you will be sheltered from the cold and the bad weather. At daybreak, the two children let him out, and he trotted over the snow into the wood. Henceforward, the bear came every evening at the same hour, laid himself on the hearth, and allowed the children to play with him as much as they liked, and they became so used to him that the door was never bolted until their black companion had arrived. When spring came and everything was green outdoors, the bear said one morning to Snow White, Now I must go away and may not come again the whole summer. Where are you going, dear bear? asked Snow White. I must go into the wood and guard my treasures from the bad dwarfs. In the winter, when the ground is frozen hard, 
They have to stay underneath and cannot work their way through. But now that the sun has thawed and warmed the earth, they break through, come up, seek and steal. What is once in their hands and lies in their caverns does not come so easily into daylight again. Snow White was quite sorrowful at parting, and as she unbolted the door for him and the bear ran out, the hook of the door caught him and a piece of his skin tore off. It seemed to Snow White as if she had seen gold shining through, but she was not sure. But the bear ran quickly away and soon disappeared behind the trees. After some time, their mother sent them into the forest to collect firewood. They found there a large tree which had been cut down and lay on the ground. And by the trunk, something was jumping up and down, but they could not tell what it was. As they came nearer, they saw that it was a dwarf with an old withered face and a snow white beard a yard long. The end of the beard was stuck fast in a cleft in the tree and the little fellow jumped about like a dog on a rope and did not know how to help himself. He stared at the girls with his fiery red eyes and screamed out, why do you stand there? Can't you come and render me some assistance? What is the matter with you, little man? asked Rose Red. Silly goose, answered the dwarf. I wanted to chop the tree so as to have some small pieces of wood for the kitchen. We only want little bits for the small quantity of food that we cook for ourselves. We are not like you greedy people. I had driven the wedge well in, and it was all going on right, but the detestable wood was too smooth and sprang out unexpectedly, and the tree closed up so quickly that I could not pull my beautiful white beard out. Now it is sticking there, and I can't get away. The girls took a great deal of trouble, but they could not pull the beard out, it stuck too fast. I will run and fetch somebody, said Rose Red. You great ninny, snarled the dwarf. You want to call more people? You are too, too many for me now. Can't you think of anything better? Only don't be impatient, said Snow White. I have thought of something. And she took her little scissors out of her pocket and cut the end of the beard off. As soon as the dwarf felt himself free, he seized a sack filled with gold that was sticking between the roots of the tree. Pulling it out, he growled to himself, You rude people, to cut off a piece of my beautiful beard. May evil reward you. Then he threw his sack over his shoulders and walked away without once looking at the sisters. Sometime afterwards, Snow White and Rose Red wished to catch some fish for dinner. As they came near to the stream, they saw that something like a grasshopper was jumping towards the water, as if it were going to spring in. They ran on and recognized the dwarf. Where are you going? asked Rose Red. You don't want to go into the water? I am not such a fool as that, cried the dwarf. Don't you see the detestable fish wants to pull me in? The little fellow had been sitting there fishing, and unluckily the wind had entangled his spear with the line, when directly afterwards a great fish bit at his hook. The weak creature could not pull him out, so the fish was pulling the dwarf into the water. It is true he caught hold of all the reeds and rushes, but that did not help him much. He had to follow all the movements of the fish and was in imminent danger of being drowned. 
the girls, coming at the right time, held him fast and tried to get the beard loose from the line. But, in vain, beard and line were entangled fast together. There was nothing to do but to pull out the scissors and to cut off the beard, in doing which a little piece of it was lost. When the dwarf saw that, he cried out, Is that manners, you goose, to disfigure one's face so? Is it not enough that you once cut my beard shorter, but now you have cut the best part of it off? I dare not be seen by my people. I wish you had had to run and had lost the soles of your shoes. Then he fetched a sack of pearls that lay among the rushes, and without saying a word more, he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. Soon after, the mother sent the two girls to town to buy cotton, needles, cord, and tape. The road led them by a heath, scattered over which lay great masses of rock. There they saw a large bird hovering in the air. It flew around and around just above them, always sinking lower and lower, and at last it settled down by a rock not far in the distant. Directly after, they heard a piercing, wailing cry. They ran up and saw with horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance, the dwarf, and was going to carry him off. The compassionate sisters instantly seized hold of the little man, held him fast, and struggled so long that the eagle let his prey go. When the dwarf had recovered from his first fright, he called out in his shrill voice, Could not you deal rather more gently with me? You have torn my thin coat all in tatters, awkward, clumsy creatures that you are. Then he took a sack of precious stones and slipped behind the rock again into his den. The girls, who were used to his ingratitude, went on their way and completed their business in the town. As they were coming home again over the heath, they surprised the dwarf, who had emptied his sack of precious stones on a little clean place and had not thought that anyone would come by there so late. The evening sun shone on the glittering stones, which looked so beautiful in all their colors that the girls could not help standing still to gaze. Why do you stand there gaping? cried the dwarf, his ash-colored face turning vermilion with anger. With these cross words he was going away, when he heard a loud roaring and a black bear trotted out of the wood towards them. The dwarf sprang up terrified, but he could not get to his lurking hole again. The bear was already close upon him. Then he called out in anguish, Dear Mr. Bear, spare me and you shall have all my treasures. Look at the beautiful precious stones that lie there. Give me my life, for what do you want with a poor thin little fellow like me? You would scarcely feel me between your teeth. Rather, seize those two wicked girls. They will be tender morsels for you. As fat as young quails, pray, eat them at once. The bear, without troubling himself to answer, gave the malicious creature one single stroke with his paw, and he did not move again. The girls had run away, but the bear called after them, Snow White and Rose Red, do not be frightened. Wait, I will go with you. Recognizing the voice of their old friend, they stood still, and when the bear came up to them, his skin suddenly fell off. And behold, he was not a bear, but a handsome young man dressed all in gold. 
I am a king's son, said he. I was changed by the wicked dwarf who had stolen all my treasures into a wild bear and obliged to run about in the wood until I should be freed by his death. Now he has received his well-deserved punishment. So they all went home together to the widow's cottage, and Snow White was married to the prince, and Rose Red to his brother. They divided between them the great treasures which the dwarf had amassed. The old mother lived many quiet and happy years with her daughters, but when she left her cottage for the palace, she took the two rose trees with her and they stood before her window and bore every year the most beautiful roses, one white and the other red. Once upon a time, there were three peasant sisters who lived in a humble cottage with their parents. And, as generally happens, the youngest was the most beautiful and the best tempered. And when the sisters wanted to go out, she was always ready to stay at home and do their work. Years passed quickly with the whole family and one day, the parents suddenly perceived that their three girls were grown up and that very soon they would be thinking of marriage. Have you decided what your husband's name is to be? said the father, laughingly to his eldest daughter one evening when they were all sitting at the door of their cottage. You know, that is a very important point. Yes. I will never wed any man who is not called Sigmund, answered she. Well, it is lucky for you that there are a great many Sigmunds in this part of the world, replied her father, so that you can take your choice. And what do you say, he added, turning to the second. Oh, I think there is no name so beautiful as Sigurd, cried she. Then you won't be an old maid either, answered he. There are seven Sigurds in the next village alone. And you, Helga? Helga, who was still the prettiest of the three, looked up. She also had her favorite name, but just as she was going to say it, she seemed to hear a voice whisper, Marry no one who is not called Habogi. The girl had never heard such a name and did not like it, so she determined to pay no attention. But as she opened her mouth to tell her father that her husband must be called Angel, she found herself answering instead, If I do marry, it will be to no one except Habogi. Who is Habogi? asked her father and sisters. We've never heard such a person. All I can tell you is that he will be my husband, if I ever have one, returned Helga, and that was all she would say. Before very long, the young men who lived in the neighboring villages or on the sides of the mountains had heard of this talk of the three girls and Sigmunds and Sigurds in scores came to visit the little cottage. There were other young men too, who bore different names, though not one of them was called Haboki, and these thought that they might perhaps gain the heart of the youngest. But though there was more than one angel amongst them, Helga's eyes seemed always turned another way. At length, the two elder sisters made their choice from out of the Sigurds and the Sigmunds, and it was decided that both weddings should take place at the same time. Invitations were sent to the friends and relations, and when on the morning of the great day they were all assembled, a rough, coarse old peasant 
left the crowd and came up to the bride's father. My name is Habogi, and Helga must be my wife, was all he said. And though Helga stood pale and trembling with surprise, she did not try to run away. I cannot talk of such things just now, answered the father, who could not bear the thought of giving his favorite daughter to this horrible old man, and hoped by putting it off that something might happen. But the sisters, who had always been rather jealous of Helga, were secretly pleased that their bridegrooms should outshine hers. When the feast was over, Habogi led up a beautiful horse from a field where he had left it to graze, and bade Helga jump up on its splendid saddle, all embroidered in scarlet and gold. You shall come back again, said he, but now you must see the house that you are to live in. And though Helga was very unwilling to go, something inside her forced her to obey. The old man settled her comfortably, then sprang up in front of her as easily as if he had been a young man, and, shaking the reins, they were soon out of sight. After some miles, they rode through a meadow with grass so green that Helga's eyes felt quite dazzled, and feeding on the grass were a quantity of large fat sheep with the curliest and whitest wool in the world. What lovely sheep! Whose are they? cried Helga. Your hobogies, answered he. All that you see belongs to him, but the finest sheep in the whole herd, which has little golden bells hanging between its horns, you shall have for yourself. This pleased Helga very much, for she had never had anything of her own, and she smiled quite happily as she thanked Habogi for his present. They soon left the sheep behind them and entered a large field with a river running through it, where a number of beautiful grey cows were standing by a gate, waiting for a milkmaid to come and milk them. Oh, what lovely cows, cried Helga again. I am sure their milk must be sweeter than any other cows. How I should like to have some. I wonder to whom they belong. To your hobogi, replied he, and some day you shall have as much milk as you like, but we cannot stop now. Do you see that big grey one with the silver bells between her horns? That is to be yours, and you can have her milked every morning the moment you wake. And Helga's eyes shone, and though she did not say anything, she thought that she would learn to milk the cow herself. A mile further on, they came to a wide common with short springy turf, with horses of all colors with skins of satin were kicking up their heels in play. The sight of them so delighted Helga that she nearly sprang from her saddle with a shriek of joy. Oh, whose are they? she asked. How happy any man must be who is the master of such lovely creatures. They are your hobogies, replied he, and the one which you think the most beautiful of all you shall have for yourself and learn to ride him. At this, Helga quite forgot the sheep and the cow. A horse of my own, said she. Oh, stop one moment and let me see which I will choose. The white one? No. The chestnut? No. I think, after all, I like the coal black one best with the little white star on his forehead. Oh, do stop, just for a minute. But Habogi would not stop or listen. When you are married, you will have plenty of time to choose one, was all he answered. And 
they rode on two or three miles further. At length, a bogey drew rain before a small house, very ugly and mean-looking, and that seemed on the point of tumbling to pieces. This is my house and is to be yours, said Habogi, as he jumped down and held out his arms to lift Helga from the horse. The girl's heart sank a little as she thought that the man who possessed such wonderful sheep and cows and horses might have built himself a prettier place to live in, but she did not say so, and, taking her arm, he led her up the steps. But when she got inside, she stood quite bewildered at the beauty of all around her. None of her friends owned such things, not even the miller, who was the richest man she knew. There were carpets everywhere, thick and soft, and of deep rich colors, and the cushions were of silk and made you sleepy even to look at them, and curious little figures in China were scattered about. Helga felt as if it would take her all her life to see everything properly, and it only seemed a second since she had entered the house when Habogi came up to her. I must begin the preparations for our wedding at once, he said, but my foster brother will take you home, as I promised. In three days, he will bring you back here, with your parents and sisters, and any guests you may invite in your company. By that time, the feast will be ready. Helga had so much to think about that the ride home appeared very short. Her father and mother were delighted to see her, as they did not feel sure that so ugly and cross-looking a man as Habogi might not have played her some cruel trick. And after they had given her some supper, they begged her to tell them all she had done. But Helga only told them that they should see for themselves on the third day when they would come to her wedding. It was very early in the morning when the party set out, and Helga's two sisters grew green with envy as they passed the flocks of sheep and cows and horses, and heard that the best of each was given to Helga herself. But when they caught sight of the poor little house which was to be her home, their hearts grew light again. I should be ashamed of living in such a place, whispered each to the other, and the eldest sister spoke of the carved stone over her doorway, and the second boasted of the number of rooms she had, but the moment they went inside, they were struck dumb with rage at the splendor of everything, and their faces grew white and cold with fury when they saw the dress of which Habogi had prepared for his bride a dress that glittered like sunbeams dancing upon ice. She shall not look so much finer than us, they cried passionately to each other as soon as they were alone. And when night came, they stole out of their rooms and taking out the wedding dress, they laid it in the ash pit and heaped ashes upon it. But a bogey who knew a little magic and had guessed what they would do, changed the ashes into roses and cast a spell over the sisters so that they could not leave the spot for a whole day, and everyone who passed by mocked at them. The next morning when they all awoke, the ugly tumble-down house had disappeared, and in its place stood a splendid palace. The guest's eyes sought in vain for the bridegroom, but could only see a handsome young man with a coat of blue velvet and silver and a gold crown upon his head. Who is that? they asked Helga. That is my Habogi, said she.